Hello, everyone. Welcome to EduTalk. EduTalk is a bi-weekly virtual talk show created out of the need for a global learning community focused on topics in education that directly impact Caribbean nations and diaspora nationals working across the globe. EduTalk features teachers, principals, administrators, business leaders, and dignitaries who share their expertise on critical topics faced in education today with the common goal of moving education forward and all students upward. My name is Dr. Duane Dice, I'm your host. I am founder and C CEO of Education Solutions International, Inc. Please visit educationsolutionsinternational.org to learn more about how ESI provides uh, support to students, educators, and school communities. And please subscribe to receive ESI's update. Today, we are welcome, we are welcoming again to our show, um, someone who is not a stranger at all to EduTalk is Mr. Philip Penaritis. And uh, I want to him to, to talk a little bit about himself again, in case you missed the last show a couple of weeks ago, well, in February, actually, we were talking about Black history and Caribbean history. And um, so we're going to talk about the um, her story. It's a, it's a topic created by uh, Mr. Penaritis. Um, her story, uh, school teachers, four mothers, and Margaret Haley. Okay, we're going to talk about that. But um, Mr. Penaritis is a historian by um, trade, by personality, by everything. And he's also a man of many other titles. And uh, I'm going to ask him to share a little bit about him so that it's not coming from my mouth only, but from his. Um, welcome, uh, Philip, to our show once again, where we're talking about history. Welcome. Hi, doctor. How are you? I am well. It's so good to see you on Editalk again, where we discuss and create this life out of history that is very much alive. So um, give us a little bit about you, uh, um, Philip. What, what other titles do you have and the contribution have, have you made to this we call society? Well, I've uh, been proud in my career. To, I'm proud of my work uh, with teachers. Uh, I was a classroom teacher and myself, uh, the hardest work I ever did. And then I worked as a uh, professional development specialist, helping teachers in the Bronx, the one of the neediest areas in New York City, the poorest county in, in America. Uh, and uh, then I went on to work with teachers around New York City. And eventually, at the end of my career, I was the director of, of social studies, which is uh, what my license originally was in and what I, uh, I wrote about, I developed curriculum for, mentored teachers in, uh, in history, geography, uh, and that's uh, been a passion of mine from the earliest time. So, uh, so tell us, I, where, mm -hmm. where, can, where can people get, because I know you have some resources that we're dropping in the, the YouTube description. Um, where, what, what's the source that people can tap into to get some of your resources? Well, one of them is uh, I do a uh, blog called Six on History, mm -hmm. and um, we can post that uh, link to join, yes. mm -hmm. and uh, where there are six curated links to articles for kids and adults about a particular mm -hmm. topic, whether it be uh, a place in the world or a uh, a controversy or a historical event. Mm -hmm. And uh, another one is I'm very proud of. I was uh, one of the co-founders of the uh, Hunts Point Slave Burial Ground uh, Project, which uh, helped uh, rediscover a, a uh, cemetery for African-American workers that had been obliterated by the Parks Department. And, and now uh, there are many resources to study about the lives of those uh, enslaved workers that helped build wealth here in the Bronx. And we can post that link too. Yeah, yeah, we will. Wow, okay, that's that's very good. And a lot of people don't even know about the, that um, place, the Hunts Point right. um, Burial Ground, they don't know. So a little bit of history, they're almost buried forever. That's right. Um, 
So tell us um, a little bit of what we're talking about. Not a little bit, just give us the overview of what we're going to talk about and we'll just get straight into it for Women's History Month in this show. Yeah, yeah, this is a topic dear to my heart and, uh, and because I grew up uh, as the uh, son of a, uh, of a construction worker, I was born in Greece and came over here and went in the U.S. Navy and married a, uh, married a lovely uh, American-born woman. And she, my mother, was a elementary school teacher her whole life. Uh, uh, and she uh, taught uh, first grade. She taught uh, kindergarten and first grade, kids to read. And she loved it. And I uh, watched her come home and work and talk to parents at night and and plan her lessons and uh, was so impressed with that. And she was the first person in her, uh, which is very typical of teachers uh, in the 19th and 20th century. She was of the working class and the first person in her uh, family to get a college degree. Wow. Okay. So, okay. So, all right. So like, we're going to dive into the, our topic for today. It's called Her Story, um, School Teachers, Four Mothers and Margaret, uh, Margaret Haley. So, um, so Philip, uh, the first one that we're looking at is teacher, and you call it the six views of the teacher. Uh, yes, walk us through that, um, that concept. Well, the idea is that uh, teachers, uh, teachers are perceived by the public in one way and perceived by uh, uh, kids in another way, parents in still a third way, uh, and then how they, they see themselves and, uh, and very different. So it's a misunderstood profession. It's a profession where people make a lot of assumptions about, oh, you have it easy, you have the summers off and uh, those sort of things. So we're gonna explore in this, the next few minutes, uh, we're gonna look at some images and we're gonna talk about uh, the origins of modern day teaching. And that rests clearly uh, on the grounds of a, work, a foundation of the working class and females, mm -hmm. women. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, all right. Um, all right, so let's walk, walk us through it. And Delight as reading teacher. Yeah, uh, back in uh, the colonial era and the early uh, 19th century, there were very few schools. Uh, if you were rich, you had a tutor. And um, otherwise, the schools for most kids were in uh, what they called school marms or uh, dame schools, and here you see the depiction, and notice the depiction is is of a frail and old spinster type woman. So from the very beginning, there's stereotypes associated with this, and she's paid almost nothing, and she's the equivalent of a daycare person today. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So that's where it came from. Where do they mm -hmm. they act very motherly? The undelight type of teacher. Yep, yep. And uh, very little uh, intellectual stuff going on in most of them. And let's see the other slide. There's a, a picture of her, of a, uh, a similar school. Yep. Mm -hmm. oh, and so, okay. Yep. Notice the, she's uh, not attractive. There's, she's sitting mm -hmm. always in, these depictions, and so there's a lot of stereotype there. It's not a job with with any prestige. Mm -hmm. Are are these what you would refer to as the in the plantation days where they take it, the um, the person who will become the teacher, um, put them in a schoolhouse, and they're respected by the community um, in order for them to lead in a schoolhouse. Is that what it is like? Well, that comes a little bit later, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, these schools, these uh, dame schools would only be in areas where there were enough people to send their kids. And remember, America is a rural country. Mm -hmm. It's a vast, slowly being uh, populated as the Native American population is dwindles and 
so it uh, most people live in the country mm-hmm. and, and therefore most people are self-educated and they consist of reading the Bible. Mm-hmm. But if you have a small community, you would have a dame school. If you have a big city, you may have enough rich uh, people to put together a small academy. But that was very rare. If you, um, have a, if you own a plantation or uh, a wealthy person, you bring in a tutor for your own kids. Mm-hmm. But the idea of public education where everybody goes and it's free is uh, doesn't really start until the middle of the 19th century, as we'll see in the the following slides yeah yeah this one with sleepy hollow yeah so then there's the male teacher Mm -hmm. and the male teacher uh, teaches and this is true throughout the history the upper grades and so he may uh teach what we would call junior high today Mm -hmm. and notice this is in the washington irving legend of sleepy hollow Mm -hmm. with his anti-dutch propaganda and also the he makes a a, a caricature mm-hmm. of Ichabod Crane, and look at Ichabod, the mm-hmm. itinerant school teacher, and he's spindly legs. He's mm-hmm. he's walking, uh, carrying all his possessions. Too many mm-hmm. books. <laughs> release for the books. Yes, yes. Let's, let's look at the next slide, yeah. and and we'll see. And here he is again, another uh, depiction of same thing, bad mm-hmm. posture. Mm-hmm. He, he is uh, has a big L on his forehead. No one, <laughs> would, no one would aspire to be this guy. Yes. And so teaching, public school teaching starts out in whether male and female starts yes. out as not a very desirable position. Oh, what what? Because, you know, funny you mentioned that, because when I was growing up in Jamaica, there were mostly women and there's still mostly women in teaching. But um, they were they referred to them as you know the role model of the society that maybe a student will want to to say or desire to become a teacher. But you're saying to me that they weren't desirable um, in a couple hundred years ago. Yes. Yeah. Well, that the, yes, it's a question of uh, remember. There's very there's no public schools then, right. so it doesn't. It doesn't become a desirable position until there's more jobs available and mm-hmm. society says that now we need compulsory education. Mm-hmm. Now we're going to to make sure that every kid can go to school for free. And then the number of jobs increases exponentially. Mm-hmm. But even then, it's still it is two perceptions. The society as a whole, which yeah. doesn't value it because it doesn't pay it very much, even today. Mm -hmm. compared to other professions with similar education and the perception of the people who do the job, which do it in spite of the fact that it doesn't carry a lot of prestige. And because, and that tells us something, what does it tell us? And remember in the, the teachers are women. Mm -hmm. It tells us that the other jobs available to women working in the factory working as a, uh, what would be the equivalent of a home care attendant today, mm-hmm. are even worse. They pay less. Yeah. They yeah. have less prestige. So yeah. that's the, that, that's the, the, um, the, what you're talking about, the mm-hmm. difference in perception. Oh, wow. And then there's a female seminary in 1819. Um, yeah, and, and we included this just yes. to, to look at the, at the, um, uh, a seminary, of course, is not really. Uh, these are not stu- these kids are not studying to be uh, to be nuns. This was mm-hmm. in a big city, and a couple things to notice here: that again, the females are separated from the males, mm-hmm. and these would be the equivalent of junior high kids. Most kids in America, again, r- America's rural, and mm-hmm. the schools are small. Right. and non-graded, so you don't see something like this. But when you have uh, what looks like a school like this does, uh, you notice that the teacher is male, yeah. which means that it's he's paid more. This mm-hmm. is an unusual school. But the method of instruction, the pedagogy, mm-hmm. notice that. And it's called, we call it today, recitation. Oh. What's happening? What's happening is that the 
young lady in the front with the pointer and the big map. And mm -hmm. clearly this is a school that has those large windows and can afford big maps mm -hmm. uh, and pointers. Uh, she is being drilled by the man in the back. Mm -hmm. And that was very much what, even into the 20th century, mm -hmm. and even when I went to school, there were aspects of, of recitation. Recitation means that the guy in the back says, identify the uh, northernmost point of the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, identify the, the uh, Baltimore and Cumberland Canal. Mm -hmm. identify uh, the highest mountain and she points and that's and and then we call uh, another student so uh, mm -hmm. all students have to be ready to recite it's not like this drill it's a lot drill. of drilling well drill and kill right and right. And, and today we we do, we look down at this method and mm -hmm. um, common sense and research has said that it's not the best, it's that memorization is not the most effective way of teaching children yeah. or adults. So, um, Philip, in these schoolhouses from early as the 1800s, um, they're mostly white, white kids going there, or do they have some mixture of people? No, not in a school like this. There would, yeah. it would be very rare to have, first of all, in the South, uh, the 99% of the African Americans are enslaved, and there right. is no there is no school for them. Mm -hmm. uh, they being you know if you look at the life of Frederick Douglass, he had to he's an autodidact, someone a kind sailor, a white man gave him books, and he learned uh, he learned by himself. So uh, the the uh, people who controlled the white supremacists who controlled slavery had an interest in keeping uh, enslaved people ignorant. Mm -hmm. Oh man, okay. And also, but, uh, also education mm -hmm. costs money and yes. the whole idea of slavery is to have free stuff, free mm -hmm. labor. Let's speaking of, Let's yeah, speaking of, next. right, free, the African, mm -hmm. um, explain these two images for us, please. Yeah, we're going to look uh, in, in today a little bit with a New York focus also, because uh, after all, we're both here in, uh, mm -hmm. in the United States' largest city and the largest education system, and that's where I spent my career working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you look on the left, you see a building called the African Free School, and a couple reasons to note it. It's, it's number one. Excuse okay. me, it's number two. Number two. Right. So there is there was an African free school uh, number one, and that actually precedes by a few years in the turn mm -hmm. of the 19th century. It precedes the uh, education for white children. So mm -hmm. before the the what today is the New York City Department of Education, previously the Board of Education, mm -hmm. uh, there was the African free school, and that was funded by abolitionists, mm -hmm. many Quakers and businessmen in New York who uh, the Manumission Society has already been formed with famous people like Hamilton uh, uh, at the head of it and DeWitt Clinton. DeWitt Clinton serves mm -hmm. the governor, is famous for the uh, Erie Canal. Mm -hmm. DeWitt Clinton serves as the head of the first board of education in New York. Uh, but that before that, there have already been two, uh, excuse me, one and now two uh, African free schools set up. And the other thing about this and the picture on the right shows where it was. It's it's uh, in Mulberry Street, which is right down by the uh, city hall and mm -hmm. today Chinatown. Oh. So the building is gone and those are apartments and stores in an area that is 99% uh, Asian today. Mm -hmm. oh. So the, the ethnic succession of neighborhoods in New York. And the second thing to note about this is that it was, the drawing was done by a young man in the school. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe he was age 13. Yes, he said, yeah. yeah. So we're gonna come back to, we'll, we'll get a little bit yeah. more into the African free school. But the thing to know here is, that there is education early on, but it is it is segregated. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, and man. New York City schools remain segregated after, believe it or not, after the Civil War. And wow. each each part, each today borough, mm -hmm. Manhattan is the first to desegregate, but that's not until the 1870s. Mm -hmm. Brooklyn doesn't desegregate until the Brooklyn's its own city till 1900. Brooklyn doesn't desegregate till the 1880s. And Queens doesn't desegregate until an order from Governor Theodore Roosevelt wow. in 1900. Wow. So those, and also in teacher training, those, uh, that segregation is maintained through most of the 19th century. So you have a colored, yeah. you have a school for whites, a school for a teacher's school, like the normal school, today's Hunter College, they had their own colored, uh, their own colored contingent, and they received a diploma, a colored diploma, and they got paid colored school rates, which of course were less than white. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, this is and, Catherine Ferguson. Yeah, yeah, a famous woman who uh, was illiterate uh, her entire life. Uh, she was born a slave. She was born on her, as her master, her mother's master brought her from Virginia to New York. And in those days, you could bring your slaves and in, into the, the areas like New York uh, above the Mason-Dixon line. And as long as they, they couldn't apply to be free or they weren't free as long as you were there for less than a year. So Catherine was born uh, a, along that journey. Her mother died when she was seven, and she had a fantastic memory and committed to, to memory uh, a number of uh, great parts of the Bible, of the New Testament, mm -hmm. and, uh, and hymns. Uh, so uh, she founded the, the first Sunday school in New York, and it later became a movement taken over by uh, the abolitionists. and. Yeah. Uh, and they would uh, sing hymns and from, again, from memory and recitation. So mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about school teachers and schools, we also need to remember the sun, what became what we call now the Sunday school, yes. which, which uh, before that Sunday was set aside for, uh, for services yeah. and contemplation and mm -hmm. not working. Mm -hmm. And the idea that there would be a school with, a curriculum and the kids would be doing active stuff on mm -hmm. Sunday was not something that uh, that was common. And Miss Ferguson, her name, they called her Katie. Mm -hmm. uh, Katie Ferguson was instrumental in setting that up. Oh, wow. And she, uh, at the time when she got older and so on, what, was she able to read or she just? Yes, from yes, her? yes. Later in her life, she was able to read. She died of uh, a cholera uh, oh. epidemic. Oh. In those days, there wasn't uh, poor people didn't have access to to safe water. If mm -hmm. you were rich, you bought water from uh, people that came around in in carts with spring water. But the poor mm -hmm. drank from springs that were contaminated with uh, well, from cholera. That would be fecal matter, which means they mm -hmm. mixed. Uh, New York didn't have a proper sewage system or a proper fresh water system. Yeah, and judging by the number of people who were pouring in at the time. Oh, yeah. Okay, so then you have the, the Albany, the, the normal school. What, why, why do you call it normal school in Albany? Well, this is one of the, uh, the seminal uh, events and uh, movements in education in America. Uh, started first in a place in Vermont, but the people that popularized it was in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts with a charismatic uh, commissioner of education named Horace Mann. Mm -hmm. And Horace Mann, when he established the first normal school in um, framing on the, in Lexington. And that's, uh, wasn't, and that wasn't a coincidence. Lexington mm -hmm. and Concord, the, where blood was first shed for the American Republic, and they wanted that to, they wanted it there. So it was inextricably tied to uh, the American historical myths and, uh, and events and history. So 
it was a teacher training school and it was the first one yeah. that was sponsored by the state, by the public, a publicly funded teacher training school. And it spread, they spread around the country. There were normal schools in every state. Yeah. And the normal, the word normal comes from the French model from a, a man named LaSalle, the brothers of Christians who established Europe, or I believe France, the so first teacher training school way back when in the 1680s mm -hmm. in Rheims or uh, Rheims, as yeah. in, I think it is in French, the place with the beautiful cathedral northeast of Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, but the word nor the uh, title normal maybe was to give it a little bit of European cachet because mm -hmm. the first training school in Europe, or at least the most famous one was uh, northeast of Paris in the beautiful cathedral city of Rheims. And it was uh, called Ecole Normale. Oh. The normal school. And it was to inculcate models or norms, uh, in norms of behavior, norms of political and spiritual education. Mm. So today... All of the basically all of the state sponsored and publicly sponsored teacher training schools in the 19th century, regardless of the state. And again, the first one was in Massachusetts, became later Framingham State, located in in uh, originally near at, right on the green in Lexington, uh, where the first battle of the revolution was fought. So that happens in Massachusetts. Horace Mann is a, an advocate. He goes around the country preaching about how we have to take education away from the school marms, away mm -hmm. from these uneducated 16-year-old girls that are, that are going out into the country mm -hmm. to uh, be teachers, and let's train them properly. Mm -hmm. So here we have the quick to adopt. The first one is uh, 1839 in Massachusetts. And then 1844, a few years later, in the state capital, the first normal school. And then they spread to Oswego, believe it or not, as the second one. Uh, and the, the eventually they spread to New Paltz. And today, all the schools that are familiar to New York State residents, New Paltz, Oneonta, mm -hmm. uh, Geneseo, uh, Plattsburgh, uh, on and on. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the first training school in New York. Let's look at oh. the next slide. Yes, yes. Wow, it's a lot of information on yep. the origin. And around this time, one of the, the this man, Charles Reason, mm -hmm. has be, he was a pupil in the African free school number two. Yeah, this one. His, yeah, his brother, Patrick Reason, mm -hmm. drew that picture. Oh. And he went, and Patrick Reason went on to become a famous engraver. He, he engraved the Ain't I a Woman uh, image, shown a, a woman begging for, for respect and mercy, breaking the chains. Mm -hmm. And Patrick was a, uh, first became a teacher, became mm -hmm. the first black principal. In New York, New York in those days was Manhattan. It was oh. had been consolidated, mm -hmm. and uh, as you can see from this this picture, a man of of uh, of great uh, charisma and uh, mm -hmm. dignity, and a leader in both in in the um, abolitionist movement mm -hmm. and in the um, education, black education movement. So mm -hmm. another interesting thing, uh, apropos our, our previous discussion about Caribbean influences, yes, yes. He, his name was changed. His family name, when they moved here before the revolution as free people, mm -hmm. they came from, from Martinique, a French oh. colony in the Caribbean, and mm -hmm. the name was Raison. And the English couldn't get their lips and tongue around that too well so they changed it to reason oh. so girls and patrick raison from martinique mm -hmm. uh are were prominent uh free uh african-american uh, professionals in uh 
early in the 19th century New York City. Okay. And earlier, that's very good to know. We can, we're going to come back and talk about them um, okay. in subsequent. Um, All right. Um, the, you mentioned Hunter College uh, earlier. Right. About um, colored diploma and so on, certificate. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, go on. Well, it it's, uh, it's, uh, starts out as New York Normal School. Right. And uh, it, in 1916, I believe, Mm -hmm. It becomes Hunter College, and it's named for a president of the college named Thomas Hunter, mm -hmm. who was, and like uh, Margaret Haley, who we're going to talk about in a minute, mm -hmm. it was a prominent Irish, uh, Irish supporter of a free Ireland and um, he, an educator. And uh, the normal school is the fourth or fifth one in the state and it starts down in fourth street and broadway mm -hmm. and in 1870 the city gives it its present location in 68th street and lexington mm -hmm. avenue and oh. as you can see of course there are very few buildings that was way uptown mm -hmm. at the time very few buildings around it but it's built as a as a palace as a cathedral yeah. as a as a beautiful an imposing building uh, mm -hmm. to begin the uh, begin the task of teacher education, yeah. and through most of the next decades, it becomes the only place to uh, to get and that to you have to graduate from here in order to teach in New York, oh. and you and instruction is segregated mm -hmm. into male and female, mm -hmm. and as are the schools. It's a primary school, a second grammar school for oh. for girls. High schools are there's a girls high school and a boys high school in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that continued really right up until until uh, the present day. Here oh. in the Bronx, here in the Bronx, if you were a boy, yeah. you went to you could go to Dewitt Clinton. If you were a girl, you went to Walton High School, which was just a, a few, and that occurred that. I was teaching when that stopped being the case. So that wasn't long ago. Yes, yes. Oh, man. And then there's research around um, the segregation of boys and girls. And we can talk about that. We're, we're going to talk about that in Charles Month. Okay. Uh, in May to, to okay. see, you know, why the segregation and so on, and if it works, mm -hmm. or separation of male and female. Right. Um, the dressing room, why did you include this um, well, I image? I just wanted people yeah. to see so you being a teacher was also a I see teachers today and, and we dress any way we want. We mm -hmm. can go to school with um, there is no dress code. Right. Very different from the early days. Whether you you were a uh, black teacher or white teacher, uh, it was a very strict, so like going to gym, you <laughs> went first into the dressing room mm -hmm. and you changed into your teaching outfit, oh. which you modeled. And if you look closely, you'll see that the teacher's costume mm -hmm. consists of everything is there is no skin showing at all. Mm -hmm. You have every possible area of flesh covered, you mm -hmm. long sleeves, petticoats, uh, down your dresses, down to your shoes, mm -hmm. uh, your buttoned up collars, mm -hmm. and no hair, mm -hmm. no uh, beautiful, long or curly mm -hmm. hair is allowed. Your hair is pulled back into a bun. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's interesting also to think of some of the the you can't be a teacher if you're if you're married in mm -hmm. in these days a female a man can but not a woman you have to be and so what is that really about and if you probe that you find out that that being a a married woman means that you have probably you may have a child and mm -hmm. also you can't even if you later on 
right up until the 40s, if you are a woman and become pregnant, mm -hmm. you can't, you lose your job. You have to yes. quit. The kids cannot see a pregnant teacher mm -hmm. because that means the teacher has had sexual relations. Mm -hmm. And so there's this very creepy, weird um, uh, perception, maybe. taboo yeah, on, yeah. on any aspect of sexuality, any mm -hmm. aspect of it's as though the teacher has to be is also consecrated as some sort of <laughs> saint yes. in, in, in some weirdly uh, puritanical American way. Yes, that is very true. And I see on the bottom of this image, um, New York Normal College, and it's 1878. Yeah, that, that's, that's Hunter. Hunter, yeah, yeah right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. All right, let's press on here. Um, and just, just real quickly, this, yeah. this is uh, from the famous American cartoonist Tom and Na Thomas Nast, mm -hmm. and it shows uh, the poor uh, kids in the American free schools are on a little island and they're being attacked by crocodiles. Mm -hmm. And the crocodiles are directed from the, across the way from that large cathedral. And that's the Vatican, that's the mm -hmm. Pope. Oh. And the crocodiles have bishops miters mm -hmm. on their heads. They are Catholic bishops. Mm -hmm. So this is the way that um, there was a, a very, very prominent anti-Catholic uh, um, uh, bent in American thinking at this time. Remember, it was a Protestant country from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And when waves of Catholic immigrants, principally mm -hmm. from Ireland, but later from, from Italy and from France and from later Poland and mm -hmm. um, the, they concentrated in the cities and they voted Democratic and with a capital D, mm -hmm. and Republicans and Protestants were appalled when they had their own schools. Mm -hmm. So Margaret Haley was, uh, was a child of, of Irish immigrants. Mm -hmm. And so like so many uh, people who were born in the working class, they also, many of them also had the disadvantage of being Catholic, which was there was a lot of prejudice against Catholic people. Oh, okay. And you can see that in this scurrilous Thomas Nast, nasty yeah. cartoon. And I, I, I'm looking at the alligator right under the mitres, close to the arms, and they look like people. They look like bishops' faces. They're, they're humans. Yep, yep. Right? So the and, and they have on, on a poor little island is yeah. the... The, the schoolmaster and the politicians right. are, are trying to hold, uh, save the American children from the, the Pope in Italy mm -hmm. and the nasty Catholics that are coming for them. So mm -hmm. that's an aspect of uh, that. That's called nativism. And, mm -hmm. but it's more than nativism. Nativism is just against immigrants. Mm -hmm. This is against particular immigrants those of the Catholic faith. Right. And remember, remember, it wasn't until 1960 that we had a Catholic president. Mm -hmm. And this and, and Joseph Biden is only the second Catholic president. Yes, yes. Out of 40 some. My goodness, that's true. All right, and Blackboard. We, yeah, this is by the famous, the famous artist Winslow Homer. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to include it because it shows, again, it isn't until World War II that America becomes more than half of the people live in cities or suburbs. Mm -hmm. It's very rural and education is, whether it's in the South, whether it has to do with, with blacks or whites mm -hmm. is largely a rural consideration. And that means that you get hired by the community, the small little school board, mm -hmm. and there is no hotel. You and to save money, you board with the, you, you have room and board with the community. And that means you spend during the school year, two months with, with in Mr. Jones house and two mm -hmm. months in Mr. Uh, Gregor's house and so on and so forth. And look at, I also wanted you to see the board and how young this 
this girl looks. So mm. literally to get out into the country, uh, very low pay. Yeah. Uh, and um, you, the, the women were, uh, they took a, like Margaret Haley first did, it mm. was basically a high school course in teaching yeah. and not the, uh, not the normal school. Yeah. And, but that's who was available to go. And women that did this reported reported uh, what you would expect. It depended. Some of the families were nice. Mm -hmm. Some of the families expected you to also be the maid mm -hmm. to, do, to come home from school and, and feed the pigs and do mm -hmm. the dishes. Some of the families, the father of the family tried to corner you in the back room. Mm -hmm. uh, all the sort of things that you you would expect. And yet tens of thousands of, of, of young women did this mm -hmm. because it was better than the other opportunities. So these were what many teachers looked like, mm -hmm. young, uh, young and almost always female. A man would not do this job. Yeah, yeah. Wow. A, man would work, a man would work as a teacher in the city or in a small town mm -hmm. for a much higher salary and have his own apartment and uh, his own space. But mm -hmm. so you went from the schoolroom mm -hmm. and here's another one, the new school yeah. mistress. And uh, the artist has made idealized, I think, of people here. Mm -hmm. Everyone is, uh, is robust and attractive, mm -hmm. but I don't think he's, look how happy the kids are to have right. the, the parent. So what can we infer? Maybe they've been without a school because when the school mistress leaves, school closes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, man. So it's, it's the same long dress, motherly type of person, no matter how, yeah, how young yeah. they are. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's take a look at this. Now, now within, the, within the school, within the community, of course, yeah. you, you can't you can't do anything that we would expect young women to do socially. Right. You can't go out with, uh, you can't date, absolutely right. not. Wow. To, to be in a car or a buggy, a carriage mm -hmm. with a man, that man must be two options, father or brother only. Mm -hmm. In fact, as we'll see at the end in the contract, you lose your job. You wow. can't go to an you can't go, forget about a bar or a restaurant. You can't go to an ice cream store. You're forbidden to go. Oh because God. that's where young people go and buy one, the, buy one another ice cream and flirt and mm -hmm. terrible things happen in ice cream stores. So you're, you're really confined. This poor gal is going to go right from these kids back to someone's house where she's going to be. And if she goes out in public, it must be in these long skirts. Mm -hmm. Yep. So look at the um, the, certi the teacher certificate. Where, yeah, what time okay. period is this? Yep, so the job of teacher becomes routinized. It becomes, uh, this is the beginning of the progressive era. Mm -hmm. And you see certification, records are start being kept. There's uh, states and provinces in Canada take over this process wow. and give the teacher uh, give the teacher regular grades mm -hmm. and give them different levels of certification. And all of this means inspectors and tests. Mm -hmm. And those are invariably done by men. Mm -hmm. And the only the only association no such thing as a union at this time. There's right. something called the NEA, which is still around mm -hmm. and very powerful. It's, the, it's not a union, though. It's an association. Right. And in, in those days, in those days, they have annual conferences. And I've read the accounts and the agendas of those. And it's remarkable. The people on stage talking, and it's always talking to and telling, <laughs> the the people in the conference who attended who are all women mm -hmm. out in the audience th the people on stage are from uh the prominent uh teachers colleges of the country in stanford and california teachers colleges of columbia 
uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, Johns Hopkins, uh, in in Howard, uh, for in, in the colored teachers as they were called. And so it's a basically those are people the who have never taught a day in their life. Mm -hmm. They uh, rather than coming from the working class, many yeah. of them are Ivy League educated, born rich uh, in country clubs and in a total different, totally different, um, totally different social class. A big exception to that is a man who's in Chicago when Margaret Haley is there. And that's the great uh, John Dewey, who oh. was, an, was an actual teacher himself in Vermont and then went on to the laboratory school and was a huge advocate for freeing the teacher and became one of the greatest American philosophers and intellectuals, moved from Chicago back to Columbia mm -hmm. uh, in New York and uh, of the, one of the great American intellectuals of all time. But yeah. here, here we have, so mm -hmm. here we're up in, in Ontario. And if you look closely at this, these are the, these are the remarks and the, the, so this teacher has been observed in these, these uh, classes that are listed there. And if you look at the man, and it is a man, you can see him on top there, uh, who's done the grading of her. It is uh, things like unnatural voice is one of the comments. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know what you do about that. Uh, and so again, a, a gender gap, a uh, uh, all of those sort of things. And, you know, in New York City, it's interesting. There were so many immigrants here that until in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, right. not, not only did you have to, to complete a certain courses to become a teacher, but when you, but you had to pass a, you had to take a mandated course in American English, if you had any sort of accent, right. you were not allowed to, you were not allowed to teach the kids. So, and of course that affected uh, many, many teachers. This was, was and is a, uh, a city of immigrants. So, you know, it's, uh, it was tough to pass these sort of things. And right. they, they made forms and pretended that it was objective, yeah. and pretended that it was scientific, but it was all uh, like in the comment of the unnatural voice, it was <laughs> pseudoscientific. Yes, yes. So um, all of this leads to um, to Margaret Haley. Uh, who, yeah. who was the Margaret Haley? You no, know, she was a, a tough Irish lady from uh, born in the prairies in in uh, near Joliet, which mm -hmm. is a big state prison in Illinois. Oh. Her, her parents moved from Ireland to Boston. Mm -hmm. In Boston, they faced uh, uh, poor jobs and uh, discrimination. There was a convent that was burned by an anti-Catholic mob that was near them. Mm -hmm. And they moved, uh, they found it, moved out west, took the train. And um, she graduated from a teacher's high school. There was mm -hmm. teacher's colleges and then also uh a high school and she found a one of the jobs that we just talked about in a rural community in uh, southern illinois 35 dollars uh 35 dollars a month uh so that's barely 500 dollars a year which in those days wasn't much she boarded right. with people and she asked for a raise uh at the end of her year she thought she had done well mm -hmm. and they denied it and she moved uh uh, when she was 18 years old, she moved to Chicago, and the only job she could find was in a, a job in near the stockyards with the families that uh, that worked in the stockyards. And it was a place of four room Hendrick School. It was called. No one else would work there. It smelled uh, in the neighborhood. The kids were the kids of uh, very poor working class people. Mm -hmm. uh, and she spent the next 20 years in that uh, four room school. 
She was a teacher. She was a primary grade teacher uh, her whole life, and almost all of the almost all of the uh, work that she did was with primary school teachers. Primary school. Uh, there were two classes of teachers in those days: high school, mostly mm -hmm. men, mm -hmm. and primary, which was almost all women. And guess what? There was a pay gap, and the pay gap was the men teachers got paid. A lot more. Oh, wow. <clears throat> wow! So she she was very very gifted with those um, little kids and tried to maneuver through the system. Right, the and she started system. right after seeing all these things. Yeah. She went. She went back to school. She went to a normal school mm -hmm. called Cook County, and Cook County had the great Francis Perkins was the head of it, and it mm -hmm. was one of the most uh, acclaimed teachers colleges in the country and there she met people like john dewey mm -hmm. like uh the famous uh, social reformer jane adams mm -hmm. was there at the time uh clarence darrow the famous oh. uh the famous attorney from the scopes trial and the yeah. founder of the aclu mm -hmm. all of wow. those people were in chicago chicago was a very progressive place mm -hmm. uh, at that time and there was uh, ideas whirling around her and she came from her uh from doing her work in the south of the stockyards and that revital that revitalized her and she loved doing that and eventually she ran for um there was a chicago teachers uh federation not a union mm -hmm. She yeah. was elected vice president and then president, and she remained in those roles for the rest of her uh, the rest of her life. She was the founder, co-founder of mm -hmm. the uh, of the Fe American Federation of Teachers, mm -hmm. Local One in mm -hmm. Chicago, the Chicago uh, Teachers Federation, which is still around, and it's uh, Local One. It was a, a union. The mm -hmm. NEA said was against unions. They didn't want, they said it was unprofessional for to be associated with tradesmen. Mm -hmm. And one of the great powers that they had in Chicago was uh, that they had the support of the community. They went out and, and papered the neighborhoods with uh, billboards uh, about the differences in their uh, the differences in wages and the things that they had to go through. And one of the most famous things that she did was the tax fight in mm -hmm. 1902. The board had passed a resolution the year before that they were going to pay Chicago teachers, give them a raise right. finally after four years. So they paid the first year. And then the following year, they said, well, there's no money. And remember, there was no contract. There was no union and no contract. Mm -hmm. So that's the big difference. A resolution isn't binding. And they said, sorry, we don't have the money. So um, so mm -hmm. one day, Margaret Haley was, uh, was, she said in her book called The Battleground, her autobiography, she said, yeah. I went to the dentist office in downtown Chicago and my appointment was uh, postponed by an hour. Or so I sat outside next to these men and they were talking about how the corporations, the big corporations, the Pullman Corporation, and et cetera, in Chicago didn't pay their taxes. Mm -hmm. And I said, what? What could that be? I'd never heard of that. So she went to the uh, county clerk and asked to see information about that. Mm -hmm. And they put her off. She was extremely determined. She came back time after time. And this, all of her effort, eventually she, she took a year off just she, so she could go to Springfield, the capital, and Chicago and find out what the situation was. She borrowed law books. She had people in the community go find out things. And sure enough, it turns out that the Board of Estimate in Chicago had been giving enormous tax breaks to the mm -hmm. rich people and they hadn't paid city taxes in years and of oh, course it was a direct connection between that and the fact that the city said oh sorry we can't pay our teachers anymore mm -hmm. so she laid all of that out she went to to springfield 
and worked for three years and had enormous rallies mm -hmm. uh, with teachers in the community and finally got a writ of mandamus from, uh, from a state court that they must pay her. Long story yeah. short, six years later, six years later, they, the uh, board, after they uh, objected for all those years, was finally forced to pay Chicago teachers anywhere between $35 and $180, which in those days was a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they had the money, the board used it to, to improve furnaces and give bonuses to police and firemen. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, this fight, putting together, learning how things went when you were a, uh, a mere immigrant woman, yeah. it, it, all of these people coalesced into the first teacher's union Mm -hmm. and the most powerful model of teachers unionism in America and yeah. everything that we have today and young teachers don't older teachers don't even realize what it mm -hmm. was like before a union when you could be fired because mm -hmm. they didn't like your skin color because mm -hmm. they didn't because you were too skinny you were too heavy you were too you had an accent you wouldn't go in the back room with the principal mm -hmm. uh, you, you mm -hmm. want to come in and work for free on Saturday for the local politicians, which they made teachers do for years, mm -hmm. because you had a political opinion mm -hmm. about that you that out of school, you wrote a letter to the editor against the war in Ukraine or for the war in Ukraine. Yeah. Whatever, whatever you did that you could be no due process, you could be fired for. You just lost your job mm -hmm. in World War One. They made everyone sign loyalty oaths. Oh my God. And you had, when you picked up your, your check, you had to sign a, an oath that you supported the constitution of the state and not mm -hmm. any overthrow of the government. Yeah. During, during the Cold War mm -hmm. and another Red Scare, every time you had to sign an oath that said, I am not now, nor have I ever been a member of the Communist Party in, in order to be. So they, yes. they, they went viciously after any teachers unions that were progressive. Yeah. But all of this work stands on the great foremothers that came before us that mm -hmm. are unknown. Most people can name a famous doctor. Most people can name a famous architect. But very few people can name famous teachers. And one of the ones, one of the heroes that made... The, the, the job, a holy job to stand and, and work with beautiful young children was Margaret Haley. Mm -hmm. And it's a privilege to, to, uh, to help bring her name uh, along with other foremothers to yeah. what we have today. Wow. This is, is very, very remarkable. Very, very remarkable. Um, and to know that um, a lot of people don't even know this about the pioneers like her, who, um, who actually paved a very, very level and smooth path for other teachers because they have done the hard work, the heavy lifting over the years. This is very remarkable. My goodness. So, um, Philip, we have, after this stalwart, um, we talk about the salaries for colored teachers back from the early 1900s. Yeah. You have, a, you have a spreadsheet here. And people don't, uh, don't know this either, that of course, so we talked about the heroes and the things that they face, the poor working class Irish and, and other white women. Yeah. If, 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 if that surprises people, then they're going to be, maybe not, but... <laughs> They'll be even more disappointed when they find out that if you happen to be a so-called colored teacher, you did all of those risks, you did all of those sacrifices, and you went to the same normal school, but you sat in a colored, in the colored section, mm -hmm. you had colored teachers, and you spent the same amount of time studying to get your degree. Mm -hmm. and 
yet you got paid less than first of all you got just like the white teachers you got paid less than the men yeah but you got paid for doing the same work maybe yeah. even harder work mm -hmm. than than your colleague who who was born caucasian yeah i even look look at the oh man you you saw this already but i'm, I'm mesmerized and, and, by... and, and the difference is not insignificant it's a no. significant difference it's not Look at even when it reaches um, 1917, male mm -hmm. whites are making, um, this is almost double what yep. male blacks are making. Well, oh. you know, it, it's interesting that we talked earlier that segregation was, was over in the schools in, uh, finally in Queens was the last borough in yep. 1900. But of course, that's the difference between de jure and de facto. Mm -hmm. the, if there's a famous um, Broadway show called The Delaney Sisters a few years ago, maybe mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ago on Broadway, mm -hmm. and it was the, the story of two Black uh, sisters who were school teachers. And the great scene in there was when they went to, uh, they had called the 1940s, 40s, early 50s, they had uh, called, they were told there was a, a teacher's job available at Roosevelt High School in the Bronx on Fordham Road. And they called the uh, principal and they had a brief interview on the phone and said, sounds great. I want you to come over. It's going to be your job. And walked into the, into the principal's office and there was a, a look of shock because he had assumed from the way they spoke and, and lack of a, a, an accent or whatever, mm -hmm. that they were white teachers. And so they were the first white, te that they were the first uh, black teachers that were hired in that school. So de, de facto, there was segregation throughout the system, mm -hmm. uh, both in the way where people lived and, and whether or not certain schools were considered colored schools like the old Benjamin Franklin school along the FDR drive, which is now Manhattan center, mm -hmm. a very good school. That mm -hmm. was the, that was the school where uh, black kids went from Harlem, but it wasn't a very good school. It didn't have, it didn't attract teachers. Uh, there was a lot of turnover. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't well funded. And uh -huh. so, so we, I mentioned Dewitt Clinton earlier. That was a very good school that was mostly white, often Jewish kids from along the Grand Concourse in the Bronx, mm -hmm. all boys. And so you have in the history of Dewitt Clinton, two famous writers, County Cullen from the Harlem Renaissance mm -hmm. and, and who was the, the um, uh, salutorian in I think 1919, uh, and, and then James Baldwin mm -hmm. in the 19, 1940s, mm -hmm. who was the editor of the uh, school paper. Mm -hmm. Both of these great black writers are from Harlem mm -hmm. and they took the train up the end of the line, the four line to DeWitt Clinton on Marshall Parkway because it was a better education because mm -hmm. their, their parents knew that they would receive that there. So uh, there was widespread um, de facto discrimination, both in allocation of resources mm -hmm. in, in, ter in terms of turnover of teachers, and also as in most places in the, the um, uh, not teaching, the past was very sanitized and it was yeah. very, it was very, a very white past that uh, you didn't see your, if you were a black child, uh, you could go through K to 12 history and mm -hmm. not see many people like you at all, except, oh, except portrayed as, as maybe helpless victims in, in slavery. Yeah. And then in well, slavery, in slavery, by the way, was always taught, where did you, where did slavery happen? On some plantation in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. You never knew that it was that it occurred here until 18, 1827 mm -hmm. was when the last the last uh, enslaved person was freed in New, in New York State. My goodness. Um. Whoa.
Uh, we we have a lot to, um, to deal with in terms of history, though, because um, a lot of these things that people should know. And it, the, the thing is, what you shared with me and I come to understand is that the, the, the longer they pro prolong this, like, for example, the, the salaries here, if you look over 10 years, if if a white male getting $76 and the black male getting $38, over a 10 year period, they will accumulate more wealth, the, the white male, more wealth, double or even triple that of the male colored, colored male wealth, um, if they're paid at the, this rate here. So, and then coupled with the segregation, yeah. it affects lives over a long period of time. Over a long period of time. And I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. people think that, you know, I've how many, oh, the election of Obama and everything, right. everything's mm -hmm. equal now. Yes. No, the, the wealth gap goes back many, many years mm -hmm. and, and is a stark difference between mm -hmm available capital that's available to, right. to buy a house or send a kid to college or or anything you're right right we're going to talk some more about that in subsequent um uh, shows because it's it's a lot to grapple with mm -hmm. um so you mentioned margaret haley um earlier and the teaching council are you able to see the screen with the yeah the teaching I am. yeah mm -hmm. right so it, it was more it wasn't just to unionize for money. It mm -hmm. was also to unionize to have a teacher voice and teacher autonomy mm -hmm. over it as they do in the colleges, what's called academic freedom. Mm -hmm. And that was important. And teachers have been fighting for that for a long time. And Haley and other teachers established something called teachers' councils, which are very similar to to what we have, uh, what schools have today, but except they had more power. And this was the answer to the domination by white male Protestants of the National Education Association that we should meet with, that we in the community should have a role in deciding not just not just the name of the school mascot or when to schedule a parents meeting, but a role in, in what our curriculum is going to emphasize about the, the community, the, in a role in deciding how we're going to network and partner with other community NGOs and advocacy groups, mm -hmm. a role in deciding people that are going to in, in jobs, how how is the principal doing? Are we going to grant her tenure or mm -hmm. not? What does she have to do? Mm -hmm. um, who's what is our school going to look like? That these decisions ought not to be made by people in the state capital. It ought not to be made. This is the only profession, unlike law or medicine or architecture. This is the only profession where people who don't practice it, non-practitioners mm -hmm. make the decisions. In medical, the, there's the AMA, the Medical Association, the Bar Association. Mm -hmm. They give tests, they set up, they regulate who can be, what are the policies of their profession? Mm -hmm. How do you belong to it? What hurdles do you have to cross? In this profession, even though we have practically the same educational background in terms of years in school and degrees as the others, mm -hmm. because of our history of women's work and women not being valued in America, those decisions are made by policymakers who have never taught a day in their life. Yeah. Every, everyone who makes the decision in the Bar Association and the American Medical Association was at one time and has an MD mm -hmm. or a JD. Yes. They, they, they did the work. Mm -hmm. True. The people who decide what we teach, what we're about, what, what teachers, who, what it takes to be a teacher, and are, are 
real estate developers or <laughs> or whoever it is. Or lawyers. Lawyers. Well, yeah. almost always lawyers. You're yeah. right. Never taught a day in their ne life. Never, ever. My yeah. goodness. All right. So this is a demonstration. And we're winding down here. Yeah, just um, to show the the so this is what they did. And you see the signs. One of the signs on the left says either give us the money that you owe us or yeah. buy us a tombstone. Mm -hmm. You're putting us, we're starving. And this is after they waited for four and five years for their money. Finally, they uh, later on, they were at one point paid in script. Mm -hmm. In other words, on payday, they got little certificates that you can redeem this at the, at the, the store for, for groceries. And they could do much better than that because the, the teachers are really working hard on paying their taxes. So Absolutely. Much. Where the corporations were not paying their yeah, taxes. Yeah, right. Which, which you can't help but notice the striking similarity to mm -hmm. today where you see yes. corporations making enormous profits mm -hmm. and sometimes getting refunds, General Electric. Here's the loop, which is the equivalent of uh, Times Square and, mm -hmm. and more in downtown Chicago, yeah. packed with front page story, mm -hmm. front page photograph showing how many people demonstrating. So one of the things that this union that Margaret Haley did so well was make coalitions with other unions. They said, yes, we are workers. We're going to belong to the AFL-CIO. Yes, I want to know the head of the carpenters union. I want to know the head of of the state workers union, because when we go on strike, they'll maybe honor our picket line and not, and and it'll be a more effective strike. Yeah. And, and that's what they did. They were very, very active today. And, and all this time, the people in the NEA are saying, no, you're professionals. You're <laughs> acting like tradesmen. But, but they weren't being paid They're like not professionals. Paid. Exactly. And they weren't being given the prestige that a professional mm -hmm. gets as an architect. Oh, you're an architect. Oh, you're a doctor. Oh, my but God. For, for a teacher, it, was, it wasn't that. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, so uh, finally, um, Philip, this uh, contract, can you walk us through some of the things? And this is 19... 19 okay, this is a form. Yeah, that you, could, that you could buy. It was a standard teacher contract mm -hmm. where you fill in the name of and then look at it says Miss. Mm -hmm. So we know it's a single woman. Yes. And as you as you look at that contract, you can see that what was important for people at the time. And uh, it's all. So I did this. I taught this repeatedly in American history in high school mm -hmm. to 16, 17 year old boys and girls. And I would um, and I would ask them to read through it a line at a time. We would talk about it. So number one, the contract is null and void if you get married. Mm -hmm. uh, number three, you have to be home between the hours of eight and six. Whoa. A curfew. You cannot be out <laughs> unless it's a school function. Four, I mentioned that you can't be in the ice cream store downtown. Uh, you number five, you can't leave town. And the kids, the kids in my high school classes would be going crazy. Oh no, I'm not going to do. Oh no, this is awful. <laughs> I'll just, let's just go quickly. Uh, null and void if you drink wine or yes. beer. You can't look at number eight. You can't ride in a carriage or a car with any man except your brother or father. I mentioned that. How about nine? Nine, oh God, and, and, dress and, and, in bright colors. Right, oh, bright God. colors, dye your hair, petticoats. Kids don't even know what petticoats was, but yeah. if you wear two petticoats, the, again, there's the, the sexuality thing. You have, you don't have a shape. You don't, you can't possibly, no one can ever look and see your legs or, or, or anything like that. Yeah. Not to wear dresses more than two. And people said, no, this is, you're making this up. This is a joke. Mm -hmm. This is actually from a, a famous book by a professor of Wisconsin that I was lucky enough to do a review for, for the Teachers College record way back in 1992. So, and 
let's the final one, number 13, in addition to Oh Saturday, my God. Yeah. You had to come in before an yes. hour early. And teachers come in early today to get their classroom set up to, to do their work, but they must be there an hour early. And mm -hmm. why? To get the fire, you had to carry the coal or the wood in. You had to scrub the floor. You had to have the fire going for the kids. Mm -hmm. So all of these things. And, and I would ask then, okay, ladies in the classroom, raise your hand. How many of you or would be willing to do this? And of course, there were no hands up. And <laughs> oh, heck no, mister, no way. But here's the point. Here's the, here's an, and I want to end with this because this is instructive. Yes. Obvious, obviously, there, these are things that today we look at and see great personal infringement on our rights. But how then do you explain if this contract is so, so awful? How do you explain the fact that there was never a law, never, they were flooded with people that wanted to do it? Mm -hmm. They so, never had, because how do you attract people under these conditions? Yes, yes. That tells us something that's important. It tells us that the other jobs, the other jobs available to ordinary women who didn't have somebody that sent them to one of the seven sisters colleges mm -hmm. or the other jobs were even worse. Yes. yes. Stocking in the, in, the, in the dry goods store, working mm -hmm. in the shoe factory where had less prestige, mm -hmm. yes, yes. less protection, Mm -hmm. less feeling of you're doing something good mm -hmm. and nurturing for society. Yes. yes. And, and believe it or not, less pay. Mm -hmm. This yeah. actually paid more and the working conditions were better than mm -hmm. what was available. And that tells you something about the status of women in American history. Mm -hmm. wow. and, today, and today we look at, at the situation and women are paid uh, still uh, way less than, than uh, men. Yeah. And, yeah, all the, the things. Fight. And, the fight yeah. still continues. Fight still continues. La lucha, the struggle. Lucha. Yes, the struggle is real and it continues. Oh my goodness. Oh, what can I say? I can't thank you enough, Philip. I cannot thank you enough. School teachers, four mothers, and of course, the stalwart, Margaret Haley, um, with us today. Thank you so much for, for being with us and for your expertise in these, these areas. It's, it's very, very powerful. I, I'm, I'm very speechless because I'm actually a student in your class as well. Yeah. I'm just take, taking it all in. It's, it's very powerful. Um, I you, hope, man. yeah, I hope our listeners and um, viewers, I hope they gather something from this, at least one thing. And uh, from time to time, we'll have um, Philip with us to explain all of this to us um, and, and more where, it, where history is concerned because we're losing it by the minute. We're losing these things by the minute in our society. We're not paying close attention to these things and that's why we're losing it. Um, can I you look, tell them? I, go on. I look forward to it. Oh yes, definitely. More, more and more conversations. Thank you, right. Doctor. Yes. Uh, for viewers, thank you so much for being on. Please visit educationsolutionsinternational.org. Please subscribe. Please also become a part of our network so you can get uh, resources and events. Um, one other thing too is to join our um, YouTube channel, Education Solutions International TV, so you can get also viewings on things that are happening around us education-wise. We're totally education. Education, not in the established sense of the four walls, but being educated means to be free, free your mind, free your thinking, and become a part of change, you know? All right, what good everybody, as they would say in Jamaica, what good. Thank you so much, um, Philip, for coming on again. And we will talk soon. Yes, All sir. Right. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.